Alice Willard once had this great response when asked if he could describe Jesus in one word. He sat back, took a deep breath, and responded, relaxed. Now, as we know throughout Scripture, for Jesus to come across as relaxed does not mean he didn't grieve or get angry or feel the weight of the world on his shoulders. But it's clear that he was never in a hurry to be anywhere other than right where he was, fully present with whomever was right in front of him, trusting and obeying his Father's way. So let me ask you, does the word relaxed describe you? It can. And for those in Christ, it will. But for many of us, it probably doesn't right now, right? The words we would probably choose to describe our life might be something more like distracted or hurried or anxious. Basically, any other words besides relaxed. And this is because we've been unconsciously trained to figure out and live our lives, Christian or not, on our own. And the result we're experiencing, right? Weariness, confusion, burnout. So why do we succumb to the cultural norm of independence and anxiety instead of living into this relaxed life of Jesus? How will we ever walk with him when we're so preoccupied with figuring everything out, living better, all while praying without ceasing, loving more? It's, it seems impossible. And it is impossible on our own. Thankfully, trusting in the Lord begins right there. And where's there? Where you're at. You see, I have good news as we begin this study through Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. God wants to meet you right where you're at. He's not going to meet you where you're not. So you might as well become more aware of where you actually are today in this moment. And if you're wondering, how in the world can I figure out where I'm at? You let your mind wander. Specifically, we can do that in prayer. Maybe you've done it, right? There you are, you begin your prayer time, dear Lord, thine is the kingdom, <laughs> the glory, and give us our daily bread, and it's good. And, and then what happens? Your mind starts to wander. Have you been there? Have you done that? Can I tell you something? A wandering mind in prayer is a gift. <gasps> yes. Because where is your mind wandering to? Jesus put it this way. He said, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. And where is your mind wandering to? Probably your treasure, and according to Jesus, that's precisely where our heart is at. So here's my encouragement. When your mind begins to wander, don't pause the prayer because it's wandering to the very thing God's welcoming you to share with him, to trust in him with. You, friend, don't have to do a single thing alone. So let's pray. Let's wander together. Heavenly Father, here we are. <sighs> We're here. We're seated. And here you are. So as we're in your presence and aware of it, I pray that I, everyone would just let their mind wander and share whatever's on their heart right now. I'm so thankful, God, we don't have to be or pretend to be anywhere else. Thanks for meeting us here. We pray. Amen. So let's begin. Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6 say this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your paths straight. Trust in the Lord. This is where we begin. And conveniently, trusting in the Lord begins right where we're at. Why though? Because trusting in the Lord is not just declaring, God, I trust you. It begins the moment you share with him precisely where you're at. Maybe you do declare it, and maybe you don't. Saying, God, I don't trust you. Or God, I don't even know how to trust you. I don't know that I, I don't know what that would actually look like. Might be a little more honest. And remember, 
God's not going to meet you where you're not. Whatever you say in honesty, imagine God's response. I can only imagine him saying, now we're talking. I mean, did we think that he would be surprised? (laughs) Prayer is not a place to be good. It's a place to be honest. So let me get honest with you about the single greatest thing I've learned about myself over the past few years as I've navigated trials, grief, financial stress, work, parenting, friendships, and homework. I went back to school. The reason I don't trust in the Lord is because I've learned to instead trust in myself. Which is why the beginning of Proverbs 3, 5 is so profound to me. So trust in the Lord not yourself. I mean, isn't it wild that we trust the Lord for eternal salvation, but the daily stuff, we feel like that's up to us. I trust the Lord to save me from all my sins, past, present, and future, but this relational conflict, that one's up for me to, up to me to figure out, right? Or our anxieties, that's on us to fix. We feel that weight, we feel that burden. And how has that been working out for us? And it starts young, us believing that we're the ones that are in control or have to be in control. I know this because I have a young one who is believing that he's the one that's actually in control. In fact, my youngest son, Jedediah, was having some behavioral issues recently. And we were driving along and I needed to fix this for him. So I said, you know, driving along, Jedediah. Yes, mama, he responds from the back seat. Who's the boss, Jedediah, he responds. You are mama. And then I heard it under his breath. But I still do what I want. (gasps) Jedediah, I'm sorry, mama. Jedediah, we're going to try this again. Buddy, who's the boss? You are mama. And then I heard it. But sometimes me. (laughs) So honest, so true, so relatable. God, you're the one in control. You're sovereign. I trust you. But I still do what I want. Lord, I'm I'm sorry. I'm sorry. It's you. You're the one in control. I'm sorry I'm so anxious. It's It's all on you. But sometimes it's on me. So why do we need to trust in the Lord? Because trusting in ourselves doesn't work. You see, because one of the greatest counterfeits to living like Jesus, living with him, is living in Christian autonomy, trying to be like him without him. I'd sum up this word autonomy in this context with two words, self-reliant, being the boss. The problem, of course, is that from start to finish, the Bible defines the Christian life and growth as one of dependence. And so when we fall into autonomy, into relying on ourselves, Our lives, of course, become burdensome and worried and anxious. And then our faith becomes pretense. You see, we get really good at being experts at the routines and the lingo and action Christian while rarely engaging in a real conversational relationship with God. The one we claim to be following is relaxed, but our lives aren't. As we hustle to become better Christians while experiencing no real power, bearing little to no eternal fruit, and unintentionally playing a part in God's story that we were never intended to play, the one in control. And it's a problem. So where did this all come from? Genesis chapter 3. Trying to be the ones in control happens in Genesis 3. We see humanity experiencing shame and blame. And then they began to hide from God, from each other, and then they experienced fear and anxiety. Can you relate? The first human experience after the fall was shame. And you know this, right? That sense of uneasiness we feel at the core of our being. It's like we are aware of the wrong that's going on in ourselves. And this is a contrast to Genesis chapter 2. We read about it. Genesis 2.25 describes Adam and Eve like this. Adam and his wife were both naked and they felt no shame. And then chapter 3, one chapter later, shame. They can't bear even seeing themselves. And rather, by the way, than going to God for a solution, they took it upon themselves to find appropriate covers for their own shame by themselves. They also experienced guilt and fear toward God, resulting in them hiding from him. We read about it after verse 7. We have verse 8. Then the man and his wife 
heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of day. They heard him and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? See, when God moves toward them in relationship, Adam's response is one of the saddest statements in the Bible. Verse 10, he, Adam, answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Rather than running to God, they hid. But thankfully, God's response to sin was different than their response to sin. And God's response to sin is different than our response to sin. We hide. He moves toward us. This, by the way, is the God of the Bible, the God we're being wooed to trust in. Romans 5, 8 says that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And this, by the way, is what distinguishes our God from every other God. This is why the Christian faith is not like every other religion. There is no God like this who runs toward sinners. I don't know where we got this notion that God can't look on sin. Jesus was God, and not only did he look on sin all the time, he pursued sinners and he hung out with them. If you think God is running away from your mess because of the decisions you've made this year, friends, that is bad theology. He moves towards you. And it started on page three. And so through Proverbs 3, 5, he is wooing us to trust in him and not ourselves anymore. Sadly, though, we've developed a habit of trusting in ourselves, of hiding and covering the bad within us, the worry, the fear, the anxiety, the guilt, trying to just cover it up. And this results in the temptation unknowingly to trust in ourselves to get better and act better, which leaves us, here it is, not relaxed, but anxious. As we try to cover deep feelings of shame by trying to be good, to hide feelings of failure and guilt by hiding the truth of ourselves, we don't even want to look at ourselves. We'd rather just try really hard to get better by ourselves, right? That's autonomy. Let me get practical about how this all looked and can look in our lives. Let's say you're sitting there at church and you hear this amazing message on prayer. Let's say I gave it. Whoa, so good. (laughs) And you think, oh, that's good. I need to pray more. You think that in your mind and you hear this or any other command like that, right? Pray more, do good, good. You feel that conviction, good. I should have done better at that. Gah, guilt. (laughs) I can do better at it. And you decide in your mind, I'm gonna do better at this. I'm gonna work on it. Let me ask you this, in that whole little dialogue with yourself, Where's God in that growth? Have you noticed that our autonomy sometimes only lasts until lunch? (laughs) So what's a better option? Are you ready? Proverbs 3, 5. Trust in the Lord, not yourself. If option one is just trying harder with the best intention to do better on our own, option two is this. You hear that same command or you hear that same invitation, pray more. But here's where you go, change it. You go to God. God, I'm sorry. I need you. Teach me. Why haven't I prayed? Let me see myself. You see, my effort in the growth equation is not to grow myself by myself. My part, your part, our part is to go to God, to trust in the Lord, and to be open to the Holy Spirit and what he wants to reveal and what he wants to transform. Begin to look at yourself with God. He wants to grow us, but it's not done by ourselves. So when it comes to our growth, the same way we grow is the same way we're saved, through him, not ourselves. We were saved. If you've given your life over to Jesus, you were saved by coming humbly, realizing we have nothing to bring but our broken lives, and then we just open our heart to the truth and the power of the Lord, right? And he brings us from death to life. That's salvation. And the same way we come for salvation, humble and open, is the exact same way we grow, with him, not apart from him. In John 15, Jesus said, apart from me, you can do nothing. Now, that's a qualitative statement, meaning 
You can get busy doing a lot of things, but here's the key. It will amount to nothing, especially not our own transformation. But man, we can spend a lot of time and energy worrying about a lot of things, can't we? I, too, have been an autonomous Christian who doesn't know how to slow down and just be with Jesus. And I have tasted the slow, powerful, relaxed life with God that I see in so many of the people whose faith I admire. I've had good conversations with them and felt at ease, even as the chaos around me remained the same. But then I, too, have simply forgotten to prioritize him the very next day. If you are discouraged by this on-again, off-again life with Jesus, don't worry. Remember, the goal is not striving. <laughs> striving is what got us into this mess in the first place. The goal is proximity, nearness, and awareness of our nearness to Jesus. And it's all going to be okay. I wish I could sit across from each of you and tell you, really, it is. It's going to be okay. You can stop for a moment. Take a breath. Slow down. It's going to be okay. As we trust in the Lord, not ourselves. Why? Trust in the Lord because He is sovereign. He's the boss. <laughs> His sovereignty means he's in control of everything. Paul writes about this, about our God, the Son, specifically in Colossians 1, 15 to 17, when he says, the Son is the image of the invisible God. If you want to know what God is like, look at Jesus. The firstborn over all creation, for in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is holding all the things and controlling all the things. And let's get personal. He has already grown you to where you're at today. <laughs> he brought you here. He also already knows where you're going to be in five years. And he's moving in your life right now. This is good news. You the one who doesn't have to be in control, huh, can relax. You don't have to figure it all out right now if you're in relationship with the sovereign one who already does. Even as we make choices, he masterfully weaves it all together to ultimately fulfill his purposes. He knows where he wants to take you. He knows how he's going to get you there. And he wants to walk with you so you can begin to experience his life in you the relaxed life of Jesus, just like my friend Eric. I was recently walking down the church hallway, it's a narrow hallway, approaching my friend who was days away from his final interview for the dream job he's wanted his entire life. In the two seconds before we were close enough to have a conversation, I thought to myself, gosh, I bet he's nervous, probably super stressed. Should I bring up the interview or just say, hey, walk past? I kind of combined them. <clears throat> hey, Eric, how you feeling about the big interview? And he responded, oh, I feel really good about it. <laughs> His like calmness was so shocking that I asked, how in the world are you so calm? He thought for a second and he smiled and he said, God is sovereign. <laughs> Even I can't screw it up. If he crushes the interview and gets the job, God is sovereign. If he crushes the interview, but doesn't get the job, God is sovereign. If he screws up the interview and doesn't get the job, God is sovereign. If he screws it up, somehow miraculously gets the job. Guess what? God is sovereign. He can't screw up God's sovereignty and neither can you. But man, we can live stressed out as if we're the ones in control or we've screwed it all up or can't we? My friend was connected, walking and sharing it all with God through the entire interview process that the byproduct was a relaxed approach to the big day. The big day was actually just another day to share what's on his heart and find God's heart toward him. He is loved, so are you, by the sovereign one in control. Even you can't screw it up. In fact, the antidote to all of our anxiety and worry and the burdens we carry is confidence in the sovereignty of God, to 
trust in the Lord begins with honesty. God already knows what's on your mind and your heart, what we're already experiencing, anxiety, worry, fear, and anger, and all the things we're really experiencing, each of them are not these annoying monkeys we need to get off of our back. No, no, no. Anxiety, for instance, isn't even a sin. It's a signal. It's like a light on this dashboard of your soul signaling to you the very thing you can and need to dialogue with God about. The first step in our journey in becoming more relaxed, more like Jesus, is going to him with everything and putting words to the anxiety, not just by declaring, God, I trust you, while ignoring your worries. No, no, no. It's by speaking them to him about all of them, going to God with the truth, even if the truth is that you don't trust him. Friends, when you declare it to him, you actually are trusting him with them. He transforms us as we go to him honestly. That is trusting in the Lord and not yourself. So let's look at this in a life of my friend Jason. He was on a walk with his dog and another dog came out of nowhere and attacked his dog. And in the process of trying to separate the dogs, he badly broke his knee. He ended up having to have surgery to fix it, but the surgery led to other big complications like blood clots that went undetected for some time. By the time he finally got to the hospital, he was in a very scary position. The first attempt to remove all these blood clots was unsuccessful, and so he was put into the ICU. It just kept getting worse and worse. And the following day, they tried the procedure again, the exact same one. This time it was successful. But because of the trauma and the blood loss, when he finally returned home, in his own words, he said, I was utterly and completely depleted and literally anemic. (laughs) One morning, His wife was wheeling him along in a wheelchair on the exact same walk where his dog was attacked. When three consecutive thoughts formed deeply in his mind, the first was this, I don't know. He didn't know what the future would hold, neither do you, right? He didn't know whether he'd be able to walk again or lead some normal life. The second thought was, I can't. There was literally nothing he could do to figure things out or make things better. He was just helpless. He can't. The first two thoughts were from Jason. The third, which followed immediately, was on the heels of the first two, was from the Lord. My grace is sufficient for you. The first and the second thoughts were still true, but because of the third thought, the one from God's heart to Jason's, Jason didn't need to figure everything out anymore. It's like, in a way, we're all in that position. These two things are, to a certain extent, totally true. You, I, we don't know what will happen to us. And we can't control what's going to happen to us. But he's sovereign. But what we can do is take it to God. And he can deposit truth into our hearts. You see, what was, and still remains, so shocking and staggering about about this to me, is that this experiential awareness of God's grace somehow answered or met and neutralized Jason's utter sense of helplessness. It didn't make the hard things go away. He still didn't have the knowledge or certainty he wanted, and he still was powerless to fix the situation, but he was deeply and fundamentally okay because he was secure, he was cared for, and he was present with the God who's in control in the midst of the helplessness. He became more relaxed. And this is a reminder to me that God won't usually spare us from suffering or tragedy, but he will be present to us in it. And that is what really matters the most. Becoming like Christ becoming relaxed is the byproduct of trusting in him, not ourselves. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. It's the byproduct of his spirit in us. The fruit of the spirit is not the fruit of our effort. It's the fruit or the byproduct of trusting in the sovereign Lord by being honest, Becoming more relaxed will happen. 
Not as we try harder to become more relaxed in our autonomy, no, no, no. But only as we open up our honest heart to the one who's not worried about a thing. At the conclusion of each of these lessons together, we're going to take time to go to God. We're not going to be content with a bunch of knowledge about Him when we have the opportunity to engage in a relationship with Him, where we can quite literally trust in the Lord, not trust in our own autonomy to try to respond really effectively and take everything that I've learned and put it into practice. Nah. We'll just go to God, open up our hearts consistently. You see, it's sometimes hard for me, too, to trust in the Lord. I get so distracted, especially in the mornings. There's so much to do. And so it's easy to forget to actively trust in the Lord because I'm doing so much to trust in myself. Sadly, there's something, though, that I know I won't forget. I know I won't forget to make coffee every morning. So I started using the Make Coffee button that I press every morning on my coffee machine as this trigger or a reminder to trust in the Lord. And some of us need these triggers and reminders. We're such forgetful people. So for me, it's coffee. And as I press the button, I start a four-part prayer, a prayer that I'm going to encourage all of us to pray throughout the entire session together. Not just this session, all seven. And here's where I begin. Part one, I show up. I press the button, which reminds me to pray. And for me, I quote Romans 12, which is just simply this, Lord, I offer myself to you. I just show up with him. You can present yourself. You can offer yourself. You can acknowledge that here I am. Second, I imagine an onion. <laughs> the onion is me as I imagine that I will peel away all the different layers of my roles and responsibilities, all these like identities that are true, but they're not the truest thing. Struggles, personality traits, absolutely anything. I'll say something like this. I'll imagine the onion, who I am is not primarily my roles. I'm not primarily a mom, a teacher, a widow. I'm not primarily my worry. I'm not primarily outgoing or worried or any other thing. At the very core of me, who I am, Lord, and this is what I say, I am in you and you are in me. I do this to peel back everything so that I can find my core identity in Christ. And then I rest on that secure identity for a moment or two. Because I and you, if you are in Christ, you are more than your titles and your responsibilities and your worries and your personality and everything else that people can see. No, no, no. In Christ is who I am at the core. Third, I let my mind wander because I know that my mind wanders to something that has captured my heart and I don't pause the prayer because that is precisely what Jesus wants to talk to me about because where my treasure is, there my heart will be. And wherever my mind is wandering is what has my heart and Jesus wants my heart. And our conversation in this third part is spontaneous and free. It's maybe even a little bit random at times. It's just like a conversation you'd have with a good friend. In this instance, my good friend is actually the one who's in control and He's not worried about a thing, so I can share it all with him, get his perspective. And fourth and finally, I listen to him and seek what he's leading me to obey. Listen and obey. And I wait, and there's a prompting every time. Some work that he set before me, someone to text, maybe a sin that needs to be confessed, a person who needs a word of encouragement. But I'll tell you this, it's always a little different, but he always directs me to love. For this study, I'd like for you to think of something you know you won't forget to do every single morning. And I want you to print out the four prompts from the study guide and let it serve as a reminder to pray a minimum of five out of seven mornings per week throughout this study. Does it sound like a lot? Maybe, but it's going to God. It's trusting in the Lord. It's not just agreeing with the study. It's engaging with one, engaging with God as you show up. Lord, I present myself to you. I present myself as an act of worship. You show up. Two, you peel away. Remember, you're more than your titles and your fears. You're in him and he's in you. 
you let your mind wander, share it all. This is Jesus' invitation to trust in Him and then listen and obey. <laughs>